For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. I hate it when the Bible sounds less like a history book and more like a description of life as we know it. One in five American workers regularly skips lunch. Experts today say that skipping meals or eating on the run is detrimental to your health. The Bible is less judgmental. It just records that reality. The only judgment is what's implicit in Jesus telling his returning disciples to get some rest. The disciples are returning from their mission trip to cast out demons and bring healing for the sick. Like most people who return from mission trips, they're full of stories about everything they've witnessed and accomplished. But Jesus' first concern is that they get a nap and a proper meal. Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves, he tells them, and rest a while. Discipleship is hard work. To sustain it, you need to take a break from it. That sounds like good news, especially for lunch-skipping kinds of congregations accustomed to the idea that service requires sacrifice. I wonder how many people watching this skipped lunch this week, ate while checking email, or gobbled down a sandwich in the car while talking on the cell phone. You know who you are. Jesus is telling you to take care to balance the doing with renewing. Action requires reflection and restoration. Pushing yourself to do more is a temporary strategy that is self-defeating over the long haul. You can't serve everybody. There will always be more need. You've got to rest, and not just for two weeks out of the year. It's not an option, it's a command, one of the Big Ten. Jesus honors it, and so should you. That all sounds like good news until Jesus complicates it just two verses later by trying to serve everybody, by trying to meet every need, by failing to balance the doing with renewing. Jesus tells them to come away to a deserted place and rest a while, so they get in the boat and hurry across the Sea of Galilee, which at 13 miles long and 8 miles wide is more accurately described as a lake. The people on the shore are so desperate to get the healing they've heard about from Jesus and his disciples that they run around the lake faster than the direct route of the boat Jesus is taking. They overtake Jesus and his disciples. And rather than telling them all to go away, rather than telling them that he's very sorry but everybody needs a break now and again, rather than telling them that his schedule is full this day and can they please come back tomorrow, he begins to teach them. It's a conflicting message that Jesus sends. On the one hand, rest. Attend to your need for rest and renewal. On the other, serve the people in front of you. The lectionary skips over the feeding of the 5,000 that happens immediately after these first few verses, but there the disciples are caught in the middle of this conflicting message. The crowds are hungry, and the disciples still haven't gotten the R&R they were looking forward to, and so they tell Jesus to send away the crowds so that everyone, including the disciples, can go and get something to eat. But Jesus tells them to give the people something to eat. It's a conflicting message that Jesus sends, which is probably why the church continues to send the same confusing message. Slow down. Observe Sabbath. Resist the culture of busyness. Sign up to serve the homeless or on this committee or singing in the choir. Lord, forgive us for the arrogance of thinking we who are made in your image do not need to rest from our labors. Lord, forgive us for passing by Samaritans in need. Jesus says, all those who are weary come to me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus also said, take up your cross and follow me. Many are called, but few are chosen. We send confusing messages to each other. Confusing messages that frankly originate in the example of Jesus himself, who seems to talk about the example of getting away and resting more than actually doing it. 
The problem with Jesus, the thing that throws off this balance between work and renewal, is his compassion. That is what keeps him from observing the kind of rest that he prescribes. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, the text says, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, we tend to think of compassion as a synonym for pity, but the word really means with suffering. And those two definitions of the same word are vastly different. As the theologian Douglas John Hall writes, pity is something you can manage from afar, not compassion. You do not have compassion, really, unless you suffer with those whom you refer. The precondition for compassion, he says, is unconditional solidarity with the ones for whom you feel it. The Greek word is even better than the English, splagnizomai, which comes from the word that means the inward parts, the guts, what the King James Version often referred to as the bowels, making for some really interesting English translations. The Greeks thought that these inward parts represented the seat of the more violent passions, such as anger and even love. But the Hebrews referred to them as the seat of the tender affections, such as kindness, benevolence, and compassion. Jesus sees the crowd and is moved in a tactile, visceral way. He feels for the people in his gut. And for anyone who knows anything about the God of the Bible, this is part of the very nature of God, the divine pathos, as Abraham Heschel named it. To the prophet, Heschel wrote, God does not reveal God's self in an abstract absoluteness, but in a personal and intimate relation to the world. God does not simply command and expect obedience. God is also moved and affected by what happens in the world. God is concerned about the world and shares its fate. Indeed, this is the essence of God's moral nature. God's willingness to be intimately involved in the history of human beings. That's the problem with Jesus. His compassion overrides his concern for himself. His compassion drives him to give more than what is good for his own well-being. It's the same problem that's driven God to work exoduses for suffering people even when they don't deserve it or to grant forgiveness even when we don't deserve it, or to welcome home prodigal sons, ungrateful daughters, even when we don't deserve it. And when we follow a God like that, it is tempting to conclude that we should ignore Jesus' admonitions to go away and rest a while, that Jesus speaks these words about rest and doesn't really mean them, that we should always put the needs of others before the needs of ourselves in every case, in every circumstance. But I think this capacity always to be moved by compassion at the sight of human need might just be what sets God apart from human beings. There are limits to our wells of compassion, and God knows it. We can only give for so long until we need to find restoration and renewal. Those who neglect that need burn out or use other people to feed their own empty places or coat themselves in thick shells to protect them from other people's suffering. Our spirits need rest and renewal, and God seems to know it. Thomas Merton wrote that there is a pervasive form of modern violence to which the idealist most easily succumbs, activism and overwork. The rush and pressure of modern life, he says, are a form, perhaps the most common form of its innate violence. 
to allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything is to succumb to violence. The frenzy of the activist, he says, neutralizes his or her work. It destroys the fruitfulness of his or her work because it kills the root of inner wisdom which makes work fruitful. Sometimes it's hard to nurture that root of inner wisdom where I live in the city of Baltimore, where so many needs are so urgent all around. But my community isn't the only one with this sort of problem. This sense of urgency runs deep in churches all across the country. No one wants to be caught slacking off from their cross-bearing duties. No one wants to be accused of being one of those goats who, Jesus, who saw Jesus in need and didn't respond. No one wants to be one of the negative characters who passed by someone in need in the story of the Good Samaritan. Even so, we best pay attention to the root of inner wisdom which makes our work fruitful. We start by recognizing that the church makes a serious error when we turn the stories of Jesus only into moral examples that we are to follow without also naming the distance between us and God. We are called to be imitators of Jesus, yes, but also to recognize that we are not Him. Our wells of compassion are not as deep as those of the God we serve. This truth defines both the good news about God and the spiritual work to which we are called. Jesus seems to know that the best way for disciples like us to deepen our compassion, our ability to share in the suffering of others, and become the kinds of healing that God calls and nurtures for this broken world, is to take time for renewal and reflection, to meditate on the abundance of God's grace, which leads to a deepening of our own to cultivate space, to breathe in God's grace just as surely as we breathe it out. Life requires both types of breathing. So does faith.